Hey guys, hope you're well. Wanted to go over an article from CNBC again. And I know a lot of you who will watch this video or will be on the live stream here momentarily are thinking about UBI and how that may affect consumer price inflation moving forward. And from watching my videos, hopefully you guys understand my position on the future of inflation or deflation when it comes to asset prices. I think the better way to say it is the future of a deleveraging in the economy, whether that's a deflationary kind of left wing type of event like Chris Cole describes or a right wing type of deleveraging that's more inflation, regardless of whether it's inflation, deflation, you've got to get a deleveraging. There's too much debt in the system. So you guys know my view. If the system stayed as is with no government intervention or no intervention from the Fed, we would see a huge deflationary deleveraging. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that that's what would happen, or at least the probabilities would favor that outcome. Now, keep in mind that could be just with asset prices. It doesn't necessarily mean that consumer prices would go down. And one thing that I would point to specifically is the 1970s when asset prices went down. Another thing I'd point to is the 1930s. Most people think that the 1930s was just an entire decade of prices going down. And that's not true. In fact, nothing is further from the truth. After about 1934, I don't have the chart in front of me, but if my memory serves me well, about 1934, inflation got back up to like 3 4% CPI. Uh, I mean, they didn't really measure that well back then. It's probably better they measure it now. But it, it wasn't just this deflationary spiral for the entire decade as far as consumer prices. It's very difficult, especially in today's day and age for consumer prices to go down for long periods of time, especially consumer prices that don't involve debt. That's kind of the catalyst. If a consumer price involves debt, i.e. cars, yeah, I could see that going down because you get cut off to access to debt. And if you've got an entire industry like the auto industry or the housing market that's really built on debt. If you take away that debt, you take away demand, prices go down. But most people don't use debt to buy groceries or to buy their car insurance or to uh, pay their rent or their health insurance, their kids' education. Well, I guess education when they take out debt. But you see what I'm saying? But that's government, so that's going to be infinite <laughs> because they don't really have to worry about a PL or negative equity or all that good stuff we have to worry about in the real world. So you get what I'm saying. I, I think that I can see cons uh, asset deflation all day long, but sustained periods of consumer price deflation eh, i don't know i mean even go back and look at 2008 we had a little dip in uh the cpi but not too much and especially when you understand how the cpi understates inflation even a dip down to let's say one two percent a negative one or two percent in reality would mean that that's still a positive probably three or four percent the very least. So that's if the system stays the same and there's no intervention. Now, obviously, most people would agree that we're going to see intervention. We have seen significant intervention in 2020, and now we're seeing it to a great degree in 2021. And we'll get into the, the article in just one moment. So then you kind of have this hybrid system where I, I kind of agree with Snyder that you could see this big run up in inflation, but it could be transitory pending on how long the government can sustain the 
creation of dollars in the real economy by issuing debt, having the Fed monetize it, and then spend it out of the TGA. So you're, you're getting a net increase in dollars that, that potentially is overwhelming the amount of dollars that are not being created by the commercial banking system. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take. It, it's not just all or nothing, right? There are all these, these cross currents, if you will. So we have to determine which cross current is going to overpower the other. Because right now we have a significant downward cross current as far as prices um, and as far as the amount of currency units in the real economy, because consumer lending has been trending down. Therefore, if consumer lending is trending down, that means the amount of dollars that are being created on net balance most likely is going down. Uh, well, the amount of dollars in the system based, if you only look at the commercial banks, the, the amount of dollars currency units would be going down not up because people are paying back more debt than they're taking than they're taking out right so on net balance dollars would be decreasing but again we have that other cross current of the government spending more dollars into the economy that tidal wave of dollars that is is acting as a counterbalance to the amount of dollars that are being decreased by the commercial banking system doing what it's doing or not doing, I should say. You see, so it, it's not this one or the other thing. It, it, it's th th these, um, you know, it's like two tectonic plates that are kind of at battle and, and rubbing against one another. There's not just one tectonic plate of inflation or one tectonic plate of deflation. They're actually going on simultaneously. I think that's what we need to get our head around. There's deflationary pressures and inflationary pressures happening at the same time. It's just a matter of which one is pushing harder. You see? It's not that, that, that there's just one or the other. There's both at all times. And I think if we understand that, it'll help us get our head around the probabilities of prices in the future. So if the system were to remain this hybrid, I think Snyder's right that you just see kind of temporary spikes in inflation. They'd be transitory, but then we'd go back to a period of disinflation. Now, I'm not saying deflation, I'm saying disinflation. So as an example, 2021, inflation goes up to 10%. And then 2009, or excuse me, 2022, it goes down to 8%. Now we're still at 8% inflation, which is high, but it's decreasing, right? Disinflation, not deflation. That's option two. Option three which is what I think is most probable, is where the Fed and the government realize what's going on and that they're basically held hostage by the commercial banking system as far as the amount of currency units that are circulating in the real economy. And they just take back control and the whole entire system changes. We go from a system of the commercial banks being responsible for the majority of the currency units to a system where the central bank is directly, not implicitly, but explicitly responsible for the amount of dollars, fugazis, in the real economy chasing goods and services. See, what, what, what's interesting about that is many of you on this live stream and, and many people, I would say 99%, of the people on CNBC or Bloomberg, they believe that this new system I'm referring to is how the current system and the old system actually worked. But they're wrong. They're wrong about that one. The Fed is not central to the dollar. 
the Fed really doesn't. Uh, now, the Fed's p- playing a bigger role now because they're monetizing the debt. But if the Fed wasn't monetizing the debt, I don't really care what their balance sheet is doing. It's not really having a direct impact on the amount of dollars in the real economy. It's only really impacting the financial economy. Now, you may say, okay, George, what gives the the primary dealer banks and the retail banks um, more balance sheet capacity so they can go ahead and create those loans? Yeah, I mean, I get it. But at the end of the day, if there's nobody to lend to, regardless of how much balance sheet capacity you have, you're not going to lend. So, you, you know, that's one one big problem right now. And that's something that Dr. Lacey Hunt always points out. Is that everyone's leveraged to the hilt. Corporations are leveraged to the hilt. The government's leveraged to the hilt. The consumer's leveraged to the hilt. The states are leveraged to the hilt. So if everyone's leveraged to the hilt, then how can we have more bank lending if those loans are being executed as a result of a bank thinking they're going to get the money back because they have a P&L, they have a balance sheet. And and I get it. And he's, he's obviously he's spot on. I just think we're going to go into a different type of system where the lending as a result of consumer to Fed and we circumnavigate the commercial banking system. And when we do that, the, the big, big difference there is that the, the loans that are being created are now not a product and it really have nothing to do with the, the, I'm trying to figure out which fingers are which here. <laughs> I'll say that this is the consumer. They really have nothing to do with the consumer's ability to pay the loan back. Why? Because on this side, the Fed here, you've got an infinite balance sheet. It really looks like something like the Japan in the 1980s, where if you read or um, watch videos of Richard Werner's work, uh, you, you have the Ministry of Finance, I believe it was called, and the BOJ. And the Ministry of Finance would basically go to the bankers and say, listen, here's your lending quota. We need you to hit this or we're putting you out of business. And we'll go ahead and backstop all the loans. So just do it. They had no choice. So it, so it, effectively what they did is they removed the profit and loss constraint for the banks and turned it into uh, success being not whether or not you're making good loans, but the measurement of success was how many loans are you making? And there was no downside for the banking system to make bad loans. See, that's really what it's all about. So how would we implement that, that system in the United States? You just move everything over to the Fed's balance sheet, And then credit score, who cares? Ability to pay the loan back, that's old school thinking. We need to capture and harness the power of the US dollar because we are a currency issuer. We are not a currency user. That's that sound familiar? <laughs> All right. So that's my rant here. Uh, but I think that kind of cues up the article well. So let's go ahead and do a screen share. All right. So today, CNBC, parents should start planning now. For July 15, start of the month, child tax credit payments. Yeah. So let's keep in mind, for those of you who don't know, the average income in the United States is much higher today 
than it was in 2019. The big difference in 2019 is although I would say that the unemployment rate dramatically understates unemployment, back then it was like three or 4%, or now it's what, six, 7%, I think it's a lot higher. But you've got a lot fewer people working. I mean, a lot fewer people working today than you did back then, but yet the incomes are up. And I'm not talking about the average income, you know, as far as the people who are working. That's some people get that confused. Like, oh, of course, average incomes have gone up because all the poor people aren't working. Uh, no, 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 we're talking about the average of everyone, <laughs> not just the people who are working. So let's read this article understanding that incomes, I, I mean, just in March alone, they're up 20%. Now, of course, that kind of fluctuates up and down. But let's just, and I believe that's a year-over-year -year number. But let's just say or assume that incomes are 10 or 15% higher today than they were in 2019. But yet we have much, much, much uh higher uh, rates of people not working uh, because you got not only got to look at the unemployment rate, but you also have to look at the labor force participation rate. Right? So that said, uh, parents anxiously waiting the July 15th start of the monthly child tax credit payments. Uh, they should start planning how they'll use the extra money. The child tax credit got a boost from the American Rescue Plan signed into law by Biden in March. The new enhanced credit increases the annual benefit per child age 17 and younger to 3,000 from 2,000. It also gives an additional 600 benefit for children under the age of six for the 2021 tax year. The full expanded benefit is available to all children 17 and under and families with 2020 adjusted gross income less than 75,000. Okay, so my point is, how is this not UBI? <laughs> People getting free money. Uh, last time I checked, that was UBI. So we're basically in UBI mode right now. I mean, we're just calling it something different. When does it explicitly become permanent? I don't know, but but I I think it's coming. I, I don't. I think the probabilities are high. Now that said, I was completely wrong with Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, to my surprise. And I talked to Tom Woods about this the other day, and. Uh, said that, hey, this is a ray of hope here. <laughs> I thought Whole Foods and Trader Joe's would never reduce their restrictions, or at least it would take, a, you know, this, this Sermon on the Mount uh, type of event <laughs> where uh, Fauci comes down from Mount Sinai <laughs> with the tablets and announces to everyone that they can go ahead and chill out but uh that did not happen and yet whole foods and trader joe's to my surprise uh reduced those restrictions so anyway in the recent past i have been completely wrong so maybe i'll be wrong here again uh i hope i am but i think the probability is high and i think most people on this live stream right now would agree that uh the quasi UBI we are seeing right now is something that's going to be with us for a long, long time. And you can see this playing out um, just anecdotally. And I'd like to get your guys' feedback on this. You can tell that the stimmies are going to uh, individuals that are making under 75000 And I don't mean this to sound the... the the wrong way, but you know, listen, it, it is what it is. And if you take offense to this, you're probably watching the wrong channel and you should just unsubscribe right now because it ain't going to get any better for you. It's only going to get worse. I'm only going to get more honest, not less honest. 
<laughs> so if you don't like what you're hearing now, you definitely aren't going to like it in the future. So go ahead and unsubscribe right now. There you go. That's a call to action. But no, seriously. And I, I think most of you would agree that I see when I go out, uh, you know, renting a car or to a restaurant or I go out shopping or whatever, I see a lot more uh, lower income demographic people there. I just do. It just, not that that's bad. It just is what it is. And why that, and the reason I noticed that is because I'm always thinking about velocity of money. It, because obviously this plays into inflation. And when you see lower income individuals spending a lot more money or consuming more than you used to see them consume in, let's say, 2019, the, the first thing that comes into my mind is, aha, okay, these, these people have a lot more purchasing power now. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm saying it is what it is. It's an observation. And therefore, uh, we should see velocity increase at least in that component of the economy. Now, velocity could be decreasing at other income brackets or whatever to where, again, it's this cross current. You have both things pushing on one another at all times. It's just which one is, is stronger. And is one stronger to a point where it's going to be sustainable and the in the the, uh, the 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 power of the one is great enough to sustain the other or over or overwhelm the other for a long period of time. So. Wait a minute here. Now they're saying monthly payments could be as much as 300 per month for kids. For now, the monthly payments are scheduled to continue to the end of the year. Huh? I thought, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. What am I getting wrong here? The fully expanded benefit is available to all children 17 and under in families with 2020 adjusted gross income, 75000 Let's see, filing jointly and ends for individuals earning 95. Okay. Though they still available for regular tax credit. Okay. The monthly payments, as much as, oh, I see, I see, I see. So they're talking about annual, how much you're getting annually. You're getting 3,000 to the, okay. Yeah, right. Additional $600 benefit. Okay. So that's what they're saying as far as this monthly payment. Yeah, so I mean, how is that not UBI? They're not even giving you a lump sum payment. They're giving it to you monthly. Hmm. Yeah, see, look at this. And this financial planner, once the money comes in, the emotions take over, she said. Have a plan of action. What do you think that plan of action is? according to Susie Orman or Dave Ramsey or XYZ financial planner, it's to take that money and put it in the stock market, put it in a 60, 40 portfolio, dollar cost average in buy and hold, buy bonds at all time highs, buy the stock market at all time highs. That's the smart thing to do. I tell you what, if I was trading crypto, which I'm not, <laughs> and I have no desire to whatsoever, if I was, I, I would just, I'd buy and sell based on stimmies because that's where this money's going. A good portion of this money is going straight into gambling on crypto. And it's not to say that crypto isn't here to stay. It's just, you know, this, this money's going straight into taking the house's money and trying to hit a home run.
All right. Well, I've got a little time tonight, guys, which I don't usually. So let's go ahead and answer a few questions. I don't usually do that on this channel, but we've got 411 people on the live stream. Maybe I should do them more during the day because we had a lot of people on the live stream this, this afternoon. Maybe it was a, a better topic of discussion. I'm not sure. But let's uh, go ahead and answer some questions. Let's see. What, what do we got, guys? Question, how would a central bank digital currency affect world reserve currency status of the dollar? Well, I don't know that it, it would directly affect the status of the dollar because you see that the dollar, you, you got to look at it like a, as a network. So the, the digital yuan is a, a network, meaning you've got all of these, you know, you, you pull up a network system. Um, like like a, an image of a network, and we we've all seen this. You know, you got these little dots that are all connected by these individual uh, paths or uh, you know lines. Uh, usually, it's like this little thing of lights that are all lit up. You know, and then they're all connected like that. Um, that's the same thing as a, a fiat currency, right? It, it's a network. It's a network of banks that have dollar denominated liabilities and those banks just talk to each other back and forth and then they go to the lender or the borrower and they lend money they create more dollars and they have all these systems you've got swap lines you've got the um, um, the swift payment system you've got the wiring dollars back and forth if i want to wire dollars to columbia as an example there's a process to do that. There's an infrastructure, right? That's all part, part of the dollar network. And as the, the debt increases that's denominated in that specific currency, the, the network becomes stronger. Now, I'm not saying that it's infallible. I'm saying the network becomes stronger because as you have more dollar-denominated debt, or XYZ currency, doesn't matter, you have you're you're creating future demand for those dollars because you need those dollars to pay back your future debt obligations you see so that's why i like to look at these things in terms of of networks also bitcoin and i think that's one reason why bitcoin will uh you know i've always said that in order for bitcoin to win i don't know it happens let's see how can i say this without making it confusing i don't think bitcoin wins I think the dollar has to lose. So let me explain. If, you've, if you're looking at competing networks right here, if the dollar just stayed, it, let's just say that uh, we had zero inflation, consumer price inflation, for the next 10 years here in the United States domestically. And let's just say that the dollar kind of went up and down in this range between 100 and 90 on the DXY for the next 10 years. I can tell you right now, the probability of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network, taking over the dollar network in that environment is incredibly low. It's very, very low. Why? Because you have that network effect that the dollar has. It, it, it's completely dominant. I mean, it's used for... 70%, let's say, of global transactions. So it's very hard to, you know, it'd be like creating another Facebook. It, it's possible, but it's really, really difficult because of, uh, of the, because it's entrenched already, because it's being used by 3 billion people. Right? The dollar is the exact same. And ironically, the, the people who are, you know, Bitcoin maximalists, and I, you know, I'm very um, friendly to Bitcoin. 
I own Bitcoin. Um, as you guys know, I, I was a little hesitant there when it was <laughs> getting up 40, 50. Not that the price meant anything to me. That was not an indicator uh, of me being a little apprehensive. The, the hysteria is why I was apprehensive, not the price. It had nothing to do with the price. So now that hysteria is kind of is, is settling down a little bit, which, which is good. I'm, I'm actually a little more bullish. Not that I'm buying, not that I'm buying, but I'm definitely more interested now than I was uh, a month or two ago in Bitcoin. But my point is uh, the, the Bitcoin maximalists say, well, why can't Dogecoin or one of the, 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 the you know, the, 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 you know what they call them. You know, I'll try to keep it kid, kid friendly here. The S coins. Why can't that take over Bitcoin? And they'll always say, oh, because that's not going to happen because Bitcoin has this network effect. Okay, well, so does the dollar. But that's that's why it would be so hard for Bitcoin to take over the dollar uh, is the exact same reason why it would be so hard for Dogecoin to take over Bitcoin. And I know there's other variables there, but that that's the main thing they're talking about. You know, So it's surprising that, that they use that as a... Uh, a talking point for Bitcoin, but yet don't really use that as a talking point for the dollar. So that's why I think the prop, if the dollar were to remain at the same levels that we see today in regarding in regards to consumer goods or um, against other fiat, it's very difficult for the Bitcoin network to take it over. But if the dollar goes down quickly to 70 on the DXY, to 50 on the DXY, and everyone starts freaking out, we get Gresham's Law, meaning the, the, the bad money is chasing out the good money, and the Fed and the government are just printing more and more and more and more because that's the only thing that they can do because consumer prices are going up. Therefore, people can't afford anything. And, 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 and instead of jacking interest rates, they know they can't then they're, they're just printing more money and you get yourself into this vicious cycle, right? That would be an example of the dollar network destroying itself. And therefore, people would look to an alternative because, because uh, the current network system, the downside far outweighs the upside of the network effect that it currently enjoys. That's why I say, in order for Bitcoin to win, um, the, it, Bitcoin can't do it on itself by its own or on its own. It, it's got to, it's got to have help from the dollar <laughs> or the dollar network, right? And so, and most people would say, okay, well, George, that's kind of a no-brainer. I think the dollar network is going to collapse in on itself. Um, yeah, that may be true, but I, I think that you, you've got to realize that, and not many people think it through in those terms, right? So going back to your your question, how would the central bank digital currency affect the reserve status? I don't know that that in and of itself would, but the power that would give the central bank and the central planners if they were to implement the strategy that I think they would, leveraging the power of the central bank digital currency would potentially lead to the demise of the dollar system. You see, if the, if the uh, or the dollar network, excuse me, if the system stays as is, like we we're saying earlier in the video, I, I don't know, um, you know, even if it's a central bank digital currency, it's going to be tough. But I think the system will change and I think uh, that they will see, sow the seeds of the dollar network demise, in which case the public is going to turn to uh, anything, any other network that, that gives them the maximum confidence. That could be the Bitcoin network. I don't know. Is this hat made from real cork? I don't know. I um, 
I think it actually is. It's like a super, super, super like thin layer. I think it is. <laughs> and obviously I got this hat in St. Bart's when I was there visiting my good buddy, Hugh Hendry. And I met some fantastic people there. And um, one of the people that I met there, a good friend, uh, was nice enough to buy this for me as a as a temporary going away gift. I'm going to say temporary because uh, as soon as things are back to normal, I'm really looking forward to getting back to St. Bart's. What's happening with the Sue the Fed ordeal? Go ahead and watch the last video I did with Robert Barnes, Patrick, and we kind of summarize everything. He, he'll be on periodically, maybe once every two months to give us an update. It's a long process, man. It's a long, long process. Are cheap rental homes still safe? Yeah. I mean, if you can get the right price. I, I would definitely look at Florida because I think your your downside as far as political risk in Florida is a lot uh, lower. Also, another thing I talked to Tom Woods about the other day is what the probability is of the same type of government restrictions we saw in 2020 and we're seeing to a certain degree today in the future when we get the next whatever it is, and I, I don't want to say the word because of uh, <laughs> of YouTube, when we get the next um, cerveza sickness. I don't know if you guys, and a lot of you are uh, new to kind of the things that I've been saying because you might not subscribe to the George Gammon channel. But one of the videos that I did there, I went back over the past 20 years and looked at all of the, we'll call it cerveza sickness like events. Most of you guys, I'm sure remember that. Remember we had uh, swine flu, we had bird flu, we had this flu, we had that flu, we had all these things. And if you look at it, we had about 10 of these things over the past 20 years. So, and usually it's obviously it's just kind of a nothing burger and it just makes the news and goes away and people just, eh, yeah, whatever. Obviously, it's, it's different this time. Um, but understanding that we have those types of events every two years, it, it would lead you to believe that we may in fact have another type, a different type of cerveza sickness that we're dealing with in 2023 or 2024. And part of my discussion with Tom was what happens then? Like the government has set a precedence that here's how you handle a cerveza sickness. And before, since they were always kind of like nothing burgers, the government's MO was just to kind of ignore it and just eh, don't pay attention. Now, I think we could go into a long period of time where the government's MO or standard operating procedure isn't just ignore it, but it's to get hyper, hyper focused on it and shoot first and ask questions later regarding closing down the economy and locking you in your house and taking away your personal liberties and freedom you know, shutting down your business etc now uh tom tom's view is that that's uh, rather unlikely because of this fatigue that i think a lot of people have right now for what's been going on 
And uh, one of the benefits we have in the United States is we can see and contrast all of the different data coming in from all the different states and then compare that to how they handled it and what restrictions they had or did not have. And then we can look back hindsight being 2020 in a year or two and say, okay, well, this worked well, this didn't work so well. Uh, but that would assume that people are rational. <laughs> and uh, that's a big leap of faith, as you guys know. So um, I think you've got to think that through. And if that is a concern that you have, then if you look at how Florida has handled and, um, you know, the takeaways from DeSantis handling the uh, Cervasa sickness in Florida, I would be far more comfortable having a rental property if I was buying today in Florida than any other state because of how it was handled. And I, I would um, rest a little easier at night knowing that, um, you know, the probability of me having to go through uh, or the local economy where my house is, where I'm trying to get renters, my local renter pool, the probability of them being out of work due to a lockdown is significantly reduced. Um, also, if you look at social unrest, if you look at, which I think we're going to see more of, if you listen to my interviews with Barnes, again, it's a, something we talk about quite extensively. And you'll notice usually you get a lot more social unrest in blue states uh, than because the, the social unrest that is organized um, they know that they can get away with a lot more legally in a blue state or a blue city than they can in a red one. That's why you'll, you're, you're not going to see, you know, the, the real um, crazy, well, maybe you will, but it's less likely to see the real crazy stuff we saw in 2020 in a, um, in a, in a Florida than it is in a Illinois or Washington or Oregon or California, something like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you can get the right deal at the right price, uh, obviously you got to make sure you're securing that with 30 year fixed rate mortgage, because you have to remember the property right now is the liability. The debt is the asset. I think you'll increase your purchasing power more with the, the debt than you will the asset by having the opportunity to pay it back over 30 years of devalued dollars. Because I, th I think they're going to at least try to suppress interest rates to the point where um, they're going to let uh, the, the real rate of inflation will be negative, uh, which would, uh, assuming that you lock in a cheap rate now and the, the real rate of inflation is higher than the rate you're paying, that's going to be a transfer of purchasing power from the bank to you. So I think that's where you increase your purchasing powers on the debt side of the transaction, uh, as opposed to Normally, historically, in a um, <laughs> who the hell knows what a normal economy is, but uh, in a typical environment, obviously, it's the reverse the property is the asset and the debt's the liability. Groman talks about off balance sheet debt. What would off balance sheet? Uh, let's see, what would off-balance sheet assets be? I mean, <laughs> the ability to tax us, that's kind of an off-balance sheet <laughs> asset, I guess. Um, and that can, and that's not infinite, that's for sure. Um, I, I don't know of too many others. I mean, the bottom line is, is if you look at the government's balance sheet, they're wildly insolvent. I mean, sh staggeringly, shockingly, horrifyingly <laughs> insolvent. Like, I know Simon Black did a study on that, and their asset side of the balance sheet is like like $4 trillion. I mean, it's, it's laughable. Um, and we all know what the, the liability side is, so... They are insolvent. It, 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 there's a reason why I call the character your drunk insolvent Uncle Sam.
All right, guys, I'll go ahead and do some shout outs. We got 452 people hanging out with us this evening. Oh, don't do a super chat. Oh, you guys shouldn't do that. I, I don't need the, the super chats. I sure appreciate it. That's very kind of you. But uh, yeah, don't, don't. I used to do the super chats, but I used to get so many of them, I just couldn't answer them. And I felt really bad about taking someone's money and not being able to answer their question directly. But so don't do super chats guys, or, or if you do as a donation, I just, I sincerely appreciate very, very kind of you. Uh, so let me go ahead and read this. Uh, what books resources do you recommend to increase my edge in markets? I'm a pharmacist that invests in biotech. Is it worth jumping into DeFi? I can't answer that question. If it's worth jumping into DeFi, I, I don't, it's not my favorite space because you're just buying a dollar for three dollars and hoping it goes to five dollars. You might not even be buying a dollar. In fact, you're probably not in DeFi. You're you're buying nothing. You're, you, there is no revenue. There is no profit. There is no nothing. You're you're buying a uh, you're not even buying a balance sheet. You're buying kind of a, a business plan, and uh, I don't like buying business plans. Uh, I like buying revenue streams. I like buying a dollar worth of revenue or profit for 50 cents. And I don't think there's a way you can really do that in DeFi. But to answer your, your main question, I think you've got to start with the Market Wizards books and um, by Jack Schweiger. And that's where I was first introduced to uh, people like Jim Rogers, actually, it might have been on YouTube, but um, oh no, 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 it was because I first read the Market Wizards books way back in like 2002 or something. That's right, I forgot about that. So that's when I first heard about Stanley Druckenmiller, uh, Jim Rogers, Ed Thorpe, and uh, all of kind of the the old school guys like that. You got to start with the Market Wizards books. And then I would go ahead and read uh, Beat the Dealer by Ed Thorpe because it really teaches you to think in terms of probabilities. And one thing that I, I thought was really cool about my interview with Chris Cole, and I'm almost positive we taped it. So you guys that watched that interview, I'm sure you saw us kind of the light bulb went on with both of us. And I was talking about how what he was saying and based on portfolio construction and probabilities I've got a little bit of an edge because I I, I started in blackjack and Chris uh, said, oh, so did I. I did the exact same thing. So it's uh, it's legit. I mean, it, it's it's I'm not just saying that just to kind of say something that no one else says. It's um, it, it, it really helps. It does. And that will give you a huge edge because how many people have you ever heard? gone out there that are investing today that say, oh, uh, you know, I used to play blackjack or I used to count cards or I, I base my strategy or my portfolio construction around the principles I learned playing blackjack. Not many. I, I'm pretty much the only one I know of. But if you go back and read Market Wizards, I think you'll be very surprised to see how many of those OG guys started, not with securities, not with stocks, not with bonds. They started playing blackjack. That's right. And then I would get into um, uh, Thomas Sowell, Basic Economics. Um, and then I would get into... I mean, any of Soul's books are fantastic, but I don't know if that gives you a huge edge in markets. I think it just helps you uh, think better about the world around you. Um, and then I just watch, you know, I, I listen to Macro Voices, Real Vision. Um, I, actually, I just, the, the Real Vision people just reached out to me uh, yesterday and asked if I would uh, go on their platform and they want to interview me. So, I, of course, I said, yes, I'd be honored. And uh, so you guys may see me on Real Vision uh, sometime in the very near future. <laughs> they, I don't know what the heck they want to interview me about. I, I kind of, when they first text me, you know, my initial response was, you know, in my head, 
I was just thinking to myself, man, I, I don't really, I don't think I'm at that level where it's appropriate for me to be on real vision. You know, you know, maybe as an interviewer, as me, if I was asking the questions, I think that would be uh, maybe appropriate, but I, I just don't see myself at that level. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I've got the credibility that those guys, you know, obviously I don't put myself in the same category as Luke Groman and, and Snyder and Lynn and, um, you know, Brent Johnson and uh, all the other fantastic people you see on Real Vision. So when they ask me to be on there, they, they want to interview me. I'm kind of like, man, I, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know how much value I can really add above and beyond uh, what the pros are talking about. Because at the end of the day, as you guys know, I'm just a, I'm just an amateur just trying to think through all the craziness. But I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see with, uh, you know, if they come back with some topics and hopefully maybe I can talk about real estate because real estate, I, I do, I definitely think I'd have, uh, I could add value there for the real vision audience. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the fed, maybe money creation, but we'll see. All right, let's go ahead and do some shout outs guys. Who do we have? We got Angelique in the house. We got Jason Kincaid, Scott Horechka. Charles Feingold, Dominique in the house, Dape. Oh, who else? We got El Chomio, Moody the Millennial, Ann Cooper, Alan. I think I said Alan, didn't I? Tred, Tradsky. Oh, High Viz Economist in the house. Patrick Coleman, Pork Barrel Investing, All Nighter Hider, Casey Sunshine, Slade, Fuqua. Joseph Gerard, Self Defense for Kids, Rosemary, Dr. Dryden One, Anthony's in the house, Black Tusk Productions, Dickie Dunn, Peter Frauen, Dr Dwayne Hunt, Jared Smith. Who else we got? Wide Winger, Alessandro, Copragoon. What is that name? That's pretty cool. Cop, Cop, Cabragoon, Cabragoon. Kapulos, Ka Kapulos, Kapulos. Boy, that is tough to pronounce. Cool name. Very cool. I love those trying to pronounce those unique names like that. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I'll see you in the next video.